go ahead and get started. And I just want to say hello and welcome to CARS 2020 online. Um, I think I've been in communication with everybody, but um, I'm Leanne Bledsoe. I'm a research hydrologist and assistant director of the Crawford Hydrology Lab at Western Kentucky University. And I know 2020 has not been the year that really any of us envisioned and that we had all hoped that we could gather um, in person and for very, you know, not just for this meeting, but, you know, for our everyday, you know, lives. Um, so I want to thank each of you, you know, for your dedication and your willingness to explore new ways um, to continue the important work of Cave and Karst uh, conservation. I know this year has been difficult. You know, we're in a global pandemic amidst a climate crisis and we're all facing um, you know, huge hurdles in addressing inequality um, and um, injustice. Um, and, but the conversations that I've had with all of you, you know, your enthusiasm, your dedication to your work, all of that that you've expressed to me and, and everything you've submitted to present and the creativity that I know has gone into our field trips and workshops and also seeing all of your faces this morning, it gives me hope. And um, now, you know, if ever, you know, I think it's important for us to come together from different disciplines, from different perspectives. Um, in conservation, education, and research, you know, in order to like build resilient, sustainable um, communities. And that is why we're here this week, right? Um, to focus on supporting those UNESCO science programs and the sustainable development goals um, to do just that. And I think it's through, you know, collaboration and our synergistic efforts that we will all be better equipped um, to think globally and act locally and for the health and well-being of all people mm -hmm. and the planet. And so um, at this time, you know, I want to acknowledge what I'm calling all my co-investigators in this virtual experiment we're doing this week. So I may have been the, um, the face <laughs> and voice of the planning committee throughout this process. Um, there's actually been a very large um, team of people that have made this meeting um, possible. And so um, I want to acknowledge So I want to acknowledge um, our uh, co-host in this meeting, as well as the planning committee. Um, the George Wright Society has been just instrumental in, in helping put all this together and managing registration and communication. And um, if you aren't familiar with them, please check out their website. They are um, they're a national organization that is all about connection, community, and conservation and they work towards a stewardship of, uh, of all protected areas. Um, so thank you, uh, Dave Harmon and um, Emily Fiala for, um, you know, for all of your support and all the work that you've put in over the past few years. Uh, I say few because we've been doing this for a couple years actually. Um, and then also um, our sponsors have also been the Mammoth Cave Biosphere Region. So I wanna thank everyone on that advisory council and all of the support that you have given, um, of course, um, also through our laboratory, through the university, um, Cave Research Foundation, um, and of course, the uh, U.S. National Park Service and the National um, and the Office of International Affairs um, and all of the kind of in-kind, you know, allowing um, all of the park personnel to to work on uh, work on these things to help um, uh, present all of this information today in our virtual field trips. Um, so I just want to say thank you to all of those folks. Um, these are the people that were on our, you know, our main team. Um, you know, 
Dr. Groves, Otto Forschler, which many of you worked with, did a lot of our logistics and our website. Um, I say logistics as far as just this uh, virtual platform. Uh, it's different than a physical physical meeting, but still requires a, a lot of uh, a lot of attention to detail. So thank you, Autumn, for that. And I apologize. Her last name is should be on there. It should be Singer. Um, so again, Rick Toomey, Bruce Powell, Barkley Tremble, uh, Pat Cambesis, and then I also do not want to leave out uh, Tammy Younglove and jo Josh Marble. They are on the information technology um, department here at Western Kentucky University and have taught us so much. Um, and so I want to give a shout out to those folks. And um, also very importantly are the um, are all of our sponsors who made this who made this this possible. Um, you know, without uh, without those sponsorships. Um, even transitioning to a virtual meeting, um, you know, would have been very difficult um, without that support. And so, again, I want to thank all of our all of our sponsors at the Edwards Aquifer, Aquifer Authority, at Pella Geo Environmental, um, <coughs> the National at NICRI, the National Cave and Karst Research Institute. Um, one of our, our really big supporters, um, of course, was the Kentucky Geological Survey. Um, and I want to um, especially thank Bill Hamburg, who will be um, will be uh, coming up here to give us a, a, a welcome message. And um, but also in the support that his staff gave us, um, Ben Tobin and Sarah Arpin were instrumental in an in abstract review and and session organization and and working on our. Um, special issue journal um, that, that will be coming up. And again, that's also sponsored by Pella. Um, so thank you. At this time, um, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Bill and, um, and let him, uh, yeah, and let him tell us a little bit about, um, the, about KGS and, and such. Okay, there we go. Can everybody can see this now, I hope. I can see it great on my screen. Uh, so good morning, everybody, and welcome. And, and especially thank you to Leanne and everybody else who worked so hard to organize the conference, first as a traditional uh, in-person event, and then made the, the rapid switch when it became apparent that we weren't going to be able to have an in-person meeting this year. So it was my original intention to literally welcome you to Kentucky and talk a little bit about some of our geology, but that obviously isn't going to work. So I can at least virtually welcome you to Kentucky and give you a five minute karstic introduction to the state. So with the Kentucky Geological Survey, our roots go all the way back to 1838 and we've been part of the University of Kentucky since 1948. And we've been er ever, ever since 1948 with a legislative mandate to perform a continuing study of the geology of the state. And that, of course, includes our karst geoheritage. And one of the ways we do that is by collaborating with people like our colleagues at Western Kentucky University and the Crawford Lab. So we're very glad to be here. And also in that context, I'm very glad that we can both help to sponsor this very important international event and also offer the, the time and resources of several of our staff, especially uh, Sarah and Ben, who are going to be leading workshops later on in, in the week, and I really appreciate their contributions to that. So let's talk a little bit about geology of Kentucky. We're really fortunate in Kentucky uh, that uh, the investment was made back in about 1960 or so to map the entire state in great detail on a scale of 1 to 24,000. And that gives us a tremendous resource to do all kinds of things, including making this dominant lithology map, where we basically reclassify the standard bedrock geology map in terms of dominant lithology. And I've pulled out in the legend all the, the carbonate units. So you can see anything ranging from purplish through greenish blue and bluish green to blue are, are various sorts of carbonate rocks. And if you just take a quick glance at the map, you can see that, uh, that about half, almost, almost half the state is underlain by carbonate rocks and the, the, the bedrock of the state ranges from uh, Ordovician to uh, 
Pennsylvania or the uppermost part of the Carboniferous, generally flat lying or, or <clears throat> very gently tilted sedimentary rocks cut by a few major fault zones. But the important part for this conference, I think, is, is that nearly half the state is underlain by carbonate rocks. And we can also combine uh, using GIS and then having some really smart people on our staff, that dominant lithology map with other information, uh, for example, the known prevalence of karst features to make a karst potential map that's extremely useful. In fact, last night at about 10 o'clock at night, I received an, uh, a very urgent email from a woman living near Louisville, Kentucky, who was writing to ask about a sinkhole that was encroaching on her house that, that she and her husband just bought about two months ago. So it's great to have resources like this that we can refer people to and immediately see what the situation is. But you can see the karst potential over about half of Kentucky ranges from low all the way to very high. And particularly you can see in the lower left-hand corner is Bowling Green, Kentucky, where Western Kentucky University is, is right in the middle of that dark purple belt of Mississippian limestones with very high karst potential. And coincidentally, so is Mammoth Cave. So we also have a lot of sinkholes in Kentucky and, and they, they can be hazards. Uh, the red dots on here show thousands of sinkholes that were tediously and manually mapped from one to 24,000 scale topographic maps many years ago. The blue areas are sinkholes that we're mapping in an automated way using our high resolution LIDAR digital elevation model of the state. So in addition to statewide geological map coverage, we're very fortunate that we have statewide airborne LIDAR coverage. In fact, in some places they're getting a second round of coverage now. So we've been using a combination of deterministic sort of hole filling methods to delineate uh, sinkholes and do field checking. And we've also been doing some exciting work looking at things like machine learning and artificial intelligence applications to uh, help improve our, uh, our, our efficiency and accuracy. Uh, the other thing I wanna to note too is that although the sinkhole distribution, if you remember the pattern for the geological map has a lot of stratigraphic control, if you look along the fault zones, particularly in Western Kentucky and along the, the Southern edge of the blue blob of sinkholes in, in Central Kentucky, is there's also some, uh, a fair amount of structural control on sinkhole distribution in Kentucky. So uh, finally, the, the carbonate rocks of Kentucky bring us a lot of, of benefits. Uh, we have scenic and, and cultural historical features like Mammoth Cave, a uh, really spectacular national park in Western Kentucky. Uh, limestone spring water is also an essential ingredient in Kentucky bourbon whiskey. Uh, and it's the, the limestone that gives rise to the fertile soils of the bluegrass region uh, that makes it a spectacular horse country. And it's why we're, we're home to the Kentucky Derby. So those are all great benefits uh, that we accrue from limestones. There are also some, some costs. So in addition to sinkholes, which can be a geological hazard, uh, it turns out that limestones are one of the leading uh, emitters of radon gas in, in Kentucky. Uh, as some of you may know, radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer and it's particularly insidious among people who are exposed to tobacco smoke. And in fact, people who are exposed to tobacco smoke and live in a house with high radon are about nine times as likely as those who don't <laughs> to develop lung cancer. So this map is, is the result of a collaboration between the Kentucky Geological Survey and some of our public health colleagues at the University of Kentucky. And we were able to take about 72,000 home indoor radon test results and merge that with our detailed statewide geological map coverage and show that different formations had statistically significantly different uh, radon profiles and use that to make a radon potential map of the, the entire state, uh, ranging from low to high. And you again see that red band of Mississippian limestones red, surrounded by brown that includes the Bowling Green area is, is, is basically the highest radon emitting area of Kentucky. And we've actually done some cost benefit work with the US Geological Survey evaluating the effectiveness of this approach in terms of convincing people to have their houses necessary. I found that on an average year, even initial states were in it, saves several million dollars per year and it won, uh, at least one life of a Kentuckian every year. So with that, I'll wrap up and I'll refer you to the, the KGS website, which is just full of information. You can even bring it up on your phone. And again, welcome you to Kentucky, at least virtually, and to the conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, really appreciate that um, nice introduction uh, to the Karst of Kentucky. I will say I'm gonna apologize to Miss Kate Webb, Dr. Kate Webb. Um, she, I was supposed to let her go first, and I got ahead of myself, so. Um, I'll turn it over to her now. Um, 
Uh, uh, Dr. Webb is our uh, director of here at uh, Western Kentucky University for programs of distinction, the applied research and technology program within the Ogden College of Science and Engineering. Well, thank you very much, Leanne, and welcome to all the participants of CARS 2020. I welcome you on behalf of Western Kentucky University the Ogden College of Science Engineering, and the Applied Research and Technology Program. Uh, this is an exciting time and a challenging time, and I applaud the organizers of this conference for being adaptable, flexible, and innovative in their approach to maintaining a persistent focus on this conference, despite all the challenges of the global pandemic. The Applied Research and Technology Program at WKU is a series of core shared facilities, laboratory facilities that really anchor the research profile of the university. Uh, there's about 10 laboratories and one of the founding laboratories was Crawford Hydrology Lab. Nick Crawford established this um, the lab in 1980 and our interaction with Mammoth Cave National Park as a university goes back more than a hundred years. Uh, Nick established the Karst Field Studies in 1979 and this has been an ongoing um, program for many, many years. WKU and Mammoth Cave National Park have long and deep ties and we anticipate that going on for many, many generations, actually. One of the key features of the Applied Research and Technology Program is providing that anchor for faculty and students. So we emphasize student training and student access to equipment. And one of the things that I that I wish to acknowledge here is that many of the participants in this conference are Nick Crawford students or his students students and it is so nice to kind of see the cycle continue. Our research program here at WKU serves our region. The mission of the university and the college is empower, connect, and serve. And the Applied Research Technology Program does that for students. It empowers students and faculty to reach out and do impactful research in the region and provides the support to do that. So we were thrilled to be able to support the Crawford Hydrology Lab when they came to us to, to ask for uh, support for KARS 2020 and I'm only sorry that we cannot be here in person because I was very much looking forward to um, meeting everyone. So um, we are running behind schedule and I, again I just wish to thank the planning committee and Chris and Leanne and Autumn for the wonderful work they've done. The conference is so well organized and I'm looking forward to the next several days. And I think CARS 2020 will really serve as a foundation for the 2021 International Year of CAVE and KARST. So without further ado, again, thank you for attending this conference. Thank you so much, Kate. And, you've, and we're almost just exactly right on schedule, um, <laughs> just a couple of minutes. And so uh, next I would like to invite Barkley Trimble to, um, to, address, uh, to address the conference. Great, thank you, Leanne. Right. Well, hello everyone. I'm Barkley Trimble, Superintendent of Mammoth Cave National Park. And as been said before, I want to welcome you to this virtual workshop and thank you for joining this opportunity to share and learn more about how to better protect and manage our valuable cave and karst resources, you know, around the globe. And as been said, I'm sorry that we're not able to experience this person in meeting and you're not able to visit us here in person at Kentucky. But I know that the event organizers have done their best to create a virtual experience that will be valuable for all of us. 
So Mammoth Cave has represented the challenges of the unknown for millennia. Uh, from the first time the first uh, Native American explorers ventured inside the cave some 5,000 years ago to the cave's rediscovery by European settlers at the turn of the 19th century, and still today uh, has been discussed as our explorers, our scientists, and visitors from the United States and around the world brave its shadowy chambers in search of wonder and new knowledge. And so named for its enormity of its mammoth subterranean vaults uh, and the unparalleled extent of its passages, Mammoth Cave is the longest known cave system in the world uh, with 412 miles or approximately 663,000 meters surveyed to date thanks uh, to the Cave Research Foundation while more cave is being discovered in surveys each year with no end in sight. When most people think of Mammoth Cave National Park, they think of, well, the cave. But many of, many of our everyday visitors do not realize that Mammoth Cave itself uh, is not the only cave in the park. In fact, there are more than 400 other caves found within our boundaries which is just under 53,000 acres or approximately 21,500 hectares. Yet even without the world's longest cave system, the land within Mammoth Cave National Park would merit national park status simply for its extraordinary density and diversity of plant and animal life. The park has one of the most biologically diverse river systems in the nation. Historically, more than 70 mussel species inhabited the Green River, where today that number has been reduced by approximately 20 species, and many of these uh, remaining species still remain and are imperiled. But even so, the Green River still holds one of the most diverse populations of mussels in the eastern United States. The mosaic of habitats and diversity of forest types, grasslands, and caves support more than 1,300 plant species and is home to more than 70 threatened, endangered, or state-listed species. Mammoth Cave is recognized as having one of the most diverse karst biota in the world, including more than 40 species that spend their entire life in the cave, such as the eyeless fish or the endangered Kentucky cave shrimp. The park has also become a key area for international research on karst hydrology and cave ecosystems. The park itself was created in 1941, and visitors are drawn to the park by its caves, scenic river valleys, bluffs, forest, and abundant wildlife. The park offers ranger-led cave tours and surface walks, camping, hiking, horseback riding, bicycling, scenic drives, canoe and kayaking, fishing, accessible trails, and picnicking to all of our visitors. The breadth of activities is available because Mammoth Cave National Park is a park on two levels. Reclaimed hardwood forest and winding riverways above and complex cave systems below. The park is also designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site and a core area of an international biosphere region. The biosphere encompasses over 909,000 acres or roughly 368,000 hectares of areas north and south of the park, including the watershed area known as the Sinkhole Plains. We work to manage the cave in a way that protects and sustains our important cave and karst resources, as well as the communities around us, but it is not something we can do alone. We do not sit in a bubble. In karst terrain, everything that happens on the surface affects the caves below, the surface and the subsurface are intricately bound together and water is a binding thread through all aspects of the park. Rainwater enters the underground river system through cracks, crevices, and thousands of sinkholes, some up to 10 miles outside the park boundary, and eventually emerges through springs into the Green River. Cooperation among the government policymakers, scientists, and local citizens is of primary importance to the ecosystem to ensure the survival of our resources and our environment. We recognize that our park is, not, is just as dependent on the health of our local communities as our communities are uh, on the success for the park for the region. To highlight this, we just wanted to mention that in 2019, Mammoth Cave National Park 
uh, was proud to receive the prestigious Good Neighbor Environmental Achievement Award from the National Park Service. We were in fact nominated by several park partners, some of who are the organizers of this workshop as we speak today. The park was recognized for our environmental stewardship and our commitment to local, state, national, and international partnerships. We have been able to successfully cultivate benefit partnerships at all level of the organization to help to achieve the important research and knowledge of the park's extensive cave and karst landscapes, all while promoting responsible economic growth, both in the park and in our surrounding communities. We work closely with numerous stakeholders to help us achieve this goal. I think as, as Leanne said earlier too, you know, now more than ever, it is it's apparent how important community connections uh, to the environment health are to our world. The global coronavirus pandemic has changed the way we go out about our daily lives. And what I have noticed though, is that the increased desire and need for people to be outside and experience nature. Mammoth Cave National Park has, been an, has seen an increased use in our trails for our hiking and biking. We've seen more and more people out on the green in the Nolan rivers, canoeing and kayaking. And, and what we've just noticed is that people just want to get out. They want to enjoy their space in the natural world. They want to be refreshed by clean air, clean water, and healthy ecosystems. The health and sustainability of our natural environment is vital to the well being of all people, no matter where they live around the globe. Our natural world has been an escape and helped many of us to get through this trying time. It is vital that we learn and manage our ecosystems in the best way to protect them for future generations. So I just want to say thank you to the CARS 2020 Planning Committee for all the work you put into creating this virtual experience. And thank you again to all who are participating and taking the time to share your ideas and thoughts about how to best protect, study, and manage our valuable cave and karst resources. We look forward to sharing the park virtually later in the week. And thank you again for taking the time with us this morning. Leanne, back to you. Thanks. Thanks, Barkley. Um, yes, and so our opening remarks are going to um, next go to uh, Dr. I'm oh, sorry, Mr. George Benny, and I just had you here in my participant pod. There we go. We'll turn it over. Um, uh, George is the director of the National uh, Cave and Karst Research Institute here in the United States and uh, out in Carlsbad. Um, and um, is also uh, currently serving as president of the International Union of Speleology. Um, and so we thought this would, this meeting, as Kate mentioned, is a great place for us to, to gather our ideas um, and come together to, um, to really be ready in, in January to kick off this international year uh, of Cave and, um, and Cave and Karst. So George, um, I'll let you, let you go. Okay, thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me to speak about the International Year. Uh, good morning or good whatever time zone you happen to be in, uh, as I see many friends from around the world. Um, many of us who've worked and studied caves and cars for, for years have often complained and, heard, and have heard complaints, why doesn't someone do something? Why, are, why do we have these problems? Why don't we study things better? Well, the International Year is the response from the International Union of Speleology to that question. Um, we are the advocates, we are the researchers, we are the educators about caves and karst. And so if we don't lead the efforts to explore, understand and protect these resources, which is what they need, uh, because as hidden resources, especially caves, we can't understand or protect them unless we, uh, unless we explore them. If we don't do something, then no one can. And this is the end slide. Something was odd here. I'm sorry. I just realized that. The beginning and end slides are actually rather similar. So let me try this. Okay, so anyway, here we go. Um, as a brief introduction though, uh, the, the International Union of Speleology, UIS, based on its original name in French, it's a nonprofit, non-governmental organization. 
It has 54 member countries around the world, uh, composed of tens of, tens of thousands of cave explorers and scientists. Most of the UIS are remote uh, cooperative uh, efforts in studying caves in Karsten, all of its aspects, scientific, cultural, economic. The International Year is our effort to develop a global partnership for understanding caves in Karst. Um, this is an international program. It's an, it, it's an education program. It's not so much for the educated community, um, for those people who are already studying caves in Karst, but for those people who need to understand the value of caves in Karst. So the major goals are you know, a scientific and public understanding of how caves and karst affect billions of people. Approximately 20% of the land surface of the planet is karst. Uh, I would argue that most people, if not all people around the world, benefit at least indirectly from cave and karst resources in some ways, even if they do not live uh, in a karst area. So this is something of true global significance. We want, to, uh, we want people to understand and show how the proper management of caves and cars is critical to global economic and environmental health. We want to build worldwide cave and cars education programs for all people, and especially to focus on developing countries. We want to promote caves and cars in sustainable development in water use, agriculture, tourism, natural cultural heritage and, uh, and other ways that, uh, that apply to these amazing international resources. And lastly, we want to establish partnerships and that's part of what this address is about. We want to establish partnerships to ensure that these activities, that these achievements continue beyond the international year. Uh, what we do next year will be great, but uh, uh, but the goal is that they continue for many, many years into the future. So what, uh, what's our current status for the international year? This year, we're focusing on planning, promoting. This talk itself is a promotional aspect of the international year, developing materials for the international year, developing partnerships from people who, help, who will help us promote it. The major event for the international year um, well, the opening event we're hoping will be at UNESCO headquarters in Paris in January. There's a question mark next to January. We're not sure. Uh, there are some pretty complicated politics to make that happen. Uh, right now, it's looking pretty good that it will occur in, uh, at UNESCO headquarters, but I can't promise it at the moment. Um, uh, but the, uh, the major event next year will be uh, the International Congress of Speleology in France. And uh, we hope it may be a, a UNESCO supported event. And part of the reason that I'm emphasizing UNESCO is that we wish to build UNESCO support in part as one of these partnerships to go forward beyond 2021, but maybe at some point in the future to have UNESCO be the actual sponsor of the International Year. We did seek UNESCO support to make this a UNESCO International Year. Politically, that's just not possible right now. Um, international Years have fallen out of favor with both the United Nations and UNESCO. Uh, it's not impossible, uh, but it is extremely difficult. And so when they become more politically favorable again, Maybe we can do this again at some point in the future, in 10, 20 years, whenever it might be. Uh, and certainly it would be good to have this sort of event more than once. So this is a call for your action. And what can you do? The first thing is to go to the website shown here on the, on the screen. You'll find a download section on the website that has materials that you can download and use uh, for, the, uh, for your promotional efforts for the international year. On the right, you see posters. This is one of two posters. Uh, we call this our technical poster. It has more text involved. The other is a general poster with less text. Um, 
You can print those, post them around your communities, your places of work. In the middle, of, there's a one page of a, out of a four page leaflet. Again, download it, print it, distribute it, pass it out at events. Um, and on the left is a planning guide. The planning guide, I think, is the most important document to help you. Uh, the planning guide gives you ideas, information on how to organize your events. And, and I'm saying your events because the International Union, the governing bureau is 12 people. 12 people cannot reach the world. We need your help, your participation to make this possible. So please download the planning guide. Uh, use that for ideas and information on what you can do. As you can see, the planning guide is shown here in Chinese. The leaflet is in Portuguese. The posters are in English. We provide this material in multiple language, languages. If your language is not shown uh, on, a, on a particular uh, item, let us know, especially if you're willing to translate it. And we can get it translated and post that material uh, on the website as well in your language to reach your people, your community. So what can you do? specifically. Um, many people think, well, it's an international year and you want me to organize some big international event. No, if you can organize a large international event, well, that's great. But most outreach, most, most of the powerful actions will happen locally or regionally. So first of all, think about partnerships. And don't just think about people who are already involved in cave and car science. Think about people who are involved with caves, who are involved with cars and don't realize it. In January, I gave a talk for a local park. Um, this park is based around a spring and I told them that they are a cursed park. They said, well, why? I said, because this is a car spring. If it wasn't for this car spring, this park would not occur. Now they are a partner in the international year and they will be developing programs and activities, not just for the year, but beyond to teach people about this car spring and why it's important to that area and why that park was created. So think about partnerships in that broad sense. Locally, think about cave cleanups, sinkhole cleanups, things where you can get local people involved, workshops, field trips for the public, lectures for the public. Go to your local regional county festivals and fairs, set up a booth, teach people, pass out materials, visit schools. Yeah, and the school visits are incredibly important because by 2022, I don't think we're gonna see any major impacts from the international year, but the biggest impacts we're gonna see in 10, 20, 30, 40 years as these little girls and boys grow up and become the scientists, the decision makers, the managers of tomorrow. So those are the people we especially need to reach. Give demonstration of caving skills, maybe for children, organize some cave art competitions. You're only limited by, our, by your imagination. Regionally, again, think of partnerships. Reach out to your show caves, your cave and karst parks. Many of you have heard of these sister city relationships. Well, why not have sister cave or sister park relationships where you take your show cave or your karst park and developing a relationship with a park somewhere else around the world. Talk to your politicians, develop laws, regulations to improve cave and karst management and protection. If you have conferences, conferences of course cannot just be open to the general public, but invite people who normally would not go to these conferences who are critical in cave and karst management in your region. Give them free registrations to attend. Develop traveling programs where you go and give lectures, show, give demonstrations. Uh, give awards to people who don't realize uh, that they are doing good things for caves and karst. The International Year will all also celebrate the first international cave animal of the year, which is the cave beetle. Cave beetles are found all around the world. Uh, identify a beetle in your country and promote it as your national cave animal and use the media to reach out to people uh, around the world. And that is hugely important in this time of COVID. The big struggle for next year, the big uncertainty is what effect will COVID have uh, on promotion? Will we be able to conduct many of these activities in person? We don't know. Uh, so we urge you to plan for COVID, develop media interviews, develop websites, social media, YouTube materials, 
develop virtual web field trips the way we're going to have for this uh, uh, for this CARS 2020 conference. Develop materials so that if we cannot go into the field to meet with people, there will still be activities. And if we can meet with people in the field, even better. We can do the, do things out in person, and we can meet with them virtually as well to be able to better promote the conference. So to close, uh, join us, please. Uh, many of us on this call have dedicated our lives to the study, protection, and exploration of caves and karst. Together, we can have a huge impact, something unlike anything ever seen before, but we can only do it together. If you have more, more questions, you want to learn more, please go to the website or feel free to contact me at any time. My email uh, address is down below. So thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, George. Thank you for sharing all of those great ideas um, to inspire us um, for the upcoming year. Um, and what a great segue uh, you gave us into our next, um, our next uh, activity here. <laughs> and that is our Stronger Together, a global conversation. And so I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to Chris, uh, Dr. Chris Groves, uh, to lead that. Yeah, thanks, Lynn. And uh, thanks for everybody joining in and you know, whatever time zone you're in. Um, I, I guess I, I would start, we've been, you know, we didn't uh, anticipate this being a virtual meeting when we started this uh, idea in 2016. Um, but those of you that know me, um, you'll know that if nothing else, I'm an optimist. And with, with all the difficulties of a global pandemic, um, I've done a conservative estimate that we've saved at least $63,000 in uh, plane tickets. <laughs> so you can take your families out and get some takeout food or, or something. So um, I want to just uh, make a, a couple of um, acknowledgments to, um, to add on to those that Leanne said. Our partners um, are um, uh, putting this on the Mammoth Cave um, uh, Biosphere Region, part of the Man in the Biosphere Program, and then also the, the George Wright Society. Um, and and at George Wright, um, I'd like to you know, throw out a, a very special acknowledgement to uh, Emily Decker Fiala, who um, uh, has been working uh, behind the scenes on the administrative parts and um, really worked very hard. Um, the uh, the meeting really um, is, is made possible by the, among other things, uh, the, um, the strong and unflagging support, you know, that we've gotten from the National Park Service uh, through the leadership of the Man in the Biosphere program. And so I'd like to acknowledge uh, Pat Mangan, um, who um, was the coordinator of the um, Man in the Biosphere MAB program at the beginning of this, who's since retired, and then his predecessor, uh, Cliff McCready, um, who's just been a, a, a fireball in, in supporting um, uh, the MAB programs nationally and, and certainly supported us here uh, at Mammoth Cave. Um, having uh, said, said that, um, let me introduce the, this idea. So Stronger Together, a, a global conversation, um, is, is an idea that um, started with uh, Dave Harmon with the uh, George Wright Society. And, uh, and I'll just briefly say, at least, at least you know, my idea of, of what, we, what, what we can do is we have just a remarkably um, diverse group of, of people who have uh, joined us uh, vir virtually um, th this week. Um, with uh, the, just a, a, a great depth of, of knowledge and experience. And I, I think an idea is that we are may, maybe the glue that, that binds us uh, following Leanne's and George's comments um, is that, um, you know, the, 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 the great sort of depth that we feel, um, as George said, you know, many people in this group having dedicated their lives to this, uh, to support um, understanding and protecting cave and karst resources. So we have this this very kind of globally homogeneous um, goal or, or desire to do this, but when it, the the implement the implementation of it is is fragmented, we have sort of you know national boundaries. There's sort of the cultural, political, economic, you know, financial. Um, uh, um, uh, 
boxes or constraints with, within which we are operating. So what we want to do is is really take advantage of this of this diverse group, and we we've invited um, uh, several people to participate in a, in a panel discussion. Um, I will introduce my uh, friend and, and colleague Peggy Gripshover, who in turn will introduce the the panel. Um, uh, Peggy is a um, uh, very, uh, very highly skilled cultural geographer. Um, I, I just um, have uh, had a great deal of fun wor working with Peggy. Um, she has a, a very broad background in um, the geography of, of baseball, horses, and other things. Uh, re recently has um, gotten interested in uh, caves, um, uh, in, and including in Mammoth Cave National Park. And I'll, I'll just highlight one, one recent accomplishment. Uh, for those of you who uh, are in the United States who are probably at least 40, uh, they, they will understand this reference. Uh, recently, uh, Katie determined that the uh, 1937 signature of Irene Ryan uh, on the wall of Mammoth Cave is, in fact, not um, Granny on the Beverly Hillbillies. So uh, I'll, I'll just uh, kind of um, leave that accomplishment. So let me turn over to Peggy and uh, she can introduce the, um, the, the panel. And thank you all very much. Thank you, Chris, so much. Um, Leanne, did you need to say something? Yes, and I, I'm, I'm so sorry. I should have mentioned this before turning it over to Chris, but we're going to ask all of our participants to please turn off your video during this so that we can just see the panelists as they converse. Um, it'll be a little bit easier to, to identify who's speaking that way. And also, if you have any questions or comments for the panel, um, to just direct those to me personally or privately in the chat. Um, and, um, and that way I can direct those um, as we need um, throughout the session. Thank you. Thanks, Peggy. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Leanne, and thank you, everyone. Welcome virtually um, to where I am, and many of us are here in Kentucky in Bowling Green. Um, so we have um, five wonderful, diverse panelists in this group, and I'm just going to briefly introduce each one, and then after you get to see who's here, uh, then we'll sort of um, have an intro question and get the conversation started. And as Leanne said, if you would like to ask a question, just throw it over there in the chat and um, ask a question. We'll, we'll try to, if we have time, uh, answer that. So first, um, I'm just gonna go through uh, our introduction for our panelists. First, uh, Sarah Gaines from the University of Rhode Island. Uh, member of the U.S. Advisory Group on Geoheritage and Geoparks USA. Welcome, Sarah. Um, uh, our second uh, panelist, uh, John Gunn, professor uh, with the University of Birmingham, UK, and chair of the International Union for Conservation of Nature's Cave and Karst Working Group, UK. He's also uh, the chair of the British Cave Research Association. Welcome, John. Um, our third participant, Echo Hirano, a faculty member in geography and coordinator of the Karst Research Group, Universitas Gajamada, Indonesia. Um, our fourth member uh, is Alexandra Maran Stevanovic. Uh, Dr. Stevanovic is museum advisor, curator, paleontologist of the Natural History Museum in Belgrade. She has vast experience in geoconservation and nature protection and currently serves on the Commission for the Geoheritage Conservation Serbian Geological Society in Serbia. And finally, uh, Tom Gilbert, uh, welcome. Uh, re he's retired U.S. Park Service, National Park Service, and is with the, the UNESCO Man and the Biosphere Program uh, USA. Welcome to all of our panelists and thank you for joining us even if it has to be in this virtual sort of little um, Brady Bunch squares as another U.S. cultural reference there <laughs> kind of um, conversation. So um, I'm going to start with a question uh, for you um, and uh, we'll start with Sarah 
then we'll go through John, Echo, Alexandra, and Tom. We'll just kind of go round robin. And then after we talk about this question, feel free panelists to jump in uh, with some follow-ups or any other things that we'd like to have in this conversation. So uh, I'll start with Sarah and everyone can have their a few minutes, about two or three minutes for each panelist to give you, give us some thoughts on this question. So from your perspective in a global community, what are the most important or relative issues in conservation or resource protection from your perspective? I know that's a really broad question, but we'll, we'll start with that. And Sarah, please, uh, what are your thoughts? Thanks very much, Peggy. I really appreciate it. And, um, you know, thanks especially to Chris and Leanne for bringing us together today, your leadership and making this event happen despite our current situation is really appreciated. So it's a general question. I'm going to give kind of a general response, but really related to um, the times that we're living through. So I think that it's incredibly important um, today that we recognize and celebrate um, intersectionality of things in general. And, and I think in caves, this is pretty straightforward when we're thinking about how biological systems and geological processes interact. Um, I think it's one thing as a researcher to study that. It's another thing as a manager of a protected area to figure out how to deal with these different processes, how to conserve them, celebrate them, share them with public and visitors. Um, I wanted to share just briefly my my um, my own background as an undergraduate. I did a thesis um, looking at paleoclimate records in caves in Belize. So I spent some time, you know, in these incredible caves in Belize, looking looking really for isotopic signatures and calcite. But my access to these caves was with a team of archaeologists who were studying uh, Mayan burial. Um, structures and histories inside the caves. And so this this combination of an archaeologic perspective on the caves with um, a, what was a geologic perspective, but really thinking about climate, which in itself is a very interdisciplinary um, question, uh, is absolutely appropriate in a cave. Of course, all these different um, researchers and processes are ongoing. Um, and I just wanted to, to talk a little bit about this idea of earth system stewardship science, which was coined by a colleague and friend of mine, Martin DeVitt in South Africa. And he really put a pressure on the stewardship part. If you, if you have a knowledge of the earth system, you have an obligation for stewardship. Um, and I think at this moment that that's taken even further. We're not obliged to be stewards. We're dependent on our stewardship of our systems because um, just as we see in the current pandemic, our relationship um, with wildlife has a huge impact on our global health. And, and in the karst systems, in the U.S., 40% of our groundwater is used um, drinking from karst aquifers. So, so there's no stretch to say that our health depends on karst systems as well. So I guess a general answer, this intersectional approach is incredibly important. Um, and I appreciate that Leanne brought up issues of justice and equity. This is important in this moment now, and it's not separate from the way we do science. The fact that we need to include more people um, in the research itself, but also as stakeholders is incredibly important. I'll stop there for now. Thanks. Okay, great. Sarah, those are uh, in incredibly important points that you bring up about, you know, diversity, stewardship, that, you know, this very holistic approach that we need to take. Thank you so much. Uh, John, would you like to weigh in for a few minutes? Yeah, I, I think for me, one of, the, uh, one of the key things is actually ensuring that the, the caves and karst that are in protected areas are really protected. And it's very easy to say this is a protected area. But when we actually look nationally and globally, many of our protected areas are actually designated just for a, a fairly narrow specific criteria. And if those criteria don't include caves and karst, then the protected area managers may be actually unaware they exist. And of course that links to what George just said about people involved in karst who don't actually know that they, they are involved in karst. And I thought I'd, I meant just at a national scale in England, something that we've, you know, I've, I've come across several times now. We have a big network of sites of special scientific interest. Uh, each of those sites has got a citation which says, why is this site designated? And it has a list of operations 
which give sort of basic management what can be done and what can't be done and they are predicated on the citation now if that citation doesn't include the caves and the cast they aren't actually protected so we could have a situation where they, there are caves underneath the site but what goes on on the surface is irrelevant to those caves it doesn't protect them and at the international scale the talk I'm going to be giving in a few minutes time I've actually tried to have a look at how many caves and karst sites there are in the UNESCO protected areas and as you'll see there are a lot of them but does that mean that the cast in them is protected now it's great to hear what Bill said in terms of mammoth but clearly you're integrating the man and biosphere with the world heritage but we've got other examples many biosphere reserves where they may be totally unaware that they've got cast within them and Sylvia Ramsar sites so the challenge really I think is to make contact with with these managers make people aware and again it fits neatly uh, I'm sort of coming my own conclusions uh, in advance as it were but it fits with what George has said as well use the international year to make contact with people who are managing protected areas that contain cast but may not realize it so uh, again I'll, I'll finish at that point uh, lots we can debate Thank you so much, John. I'm already seeing how this better together uh, theme, you know, is, is very much uh, a part of this initial conversation, which is terrific. So thank you so much, John. Uh, next up, Echo, would you like to uh, contribute to the conversation with your thoughts about these uh, uh, pressing issues? Uh, Echo, you need to unmute, hon. Thank you. Uh, you, you, yes, okay. Yes, thank you. Good. And uh, thank for, for inviting me to share some uh, knowledge and idea. Here I'm from Indonesia, from very uh, different time zone. I'm here 9 p.m. And uh, also, uh, I want to say uh, hello to all the colleagues. Uh, finally, we meet uh, in the pandemic, recent COVID, so it is a, a great uh, meeting. Yes, for me, of course, uh, the most important thing is uh, to balance between the utilization of cars and protecting cars area. We are currently have a pressure on car season during cave. It is now becoming more and more intense. So, uh, utilization of limestone for industrial raw material, for example, and also uh, the use of cave as tourism settlement and agriculture. Uh, as far as I know, the consumption of the limestone now is uh, in a freight is maybe around 600 kilograms per capita per year. It is, uh, of course, it is depending on the country uh, and the, the more developed country maybe consume more uh, limestone than the developing country. Uh, the, uh, the, and the global demand for limestone is estimated uh, to increase by 1.6% uh, per year. The use of caves is also increasing along with the cave tourism trend and so cave uh, for uh, public, not all SOCAF minutes is uh, not all uh, SOCAF manager is aware of the cave carrying capacity, especially in uh, developing country, and also cave hazard are uh, sometimes still uh, to take place, like we heard uh, last uh, year from Thailand and also in the design of the country. Uh, on the other hand, cars provide water for community around the cars and also uh, important fauna habitats. Cars and caves always have a 
endemic uh, fauna that has significant uh, natural value. Uh, Karas and cave also have a unique and beautiful landscape, of course. Uh, cave is some place also have significant cultural value as an archive of human habitats and on history. Uh, to fulfill the need of karst resource and at the, the same time conserve the natural and cultural uh, significance, uh, better land use planning policies needed. This, I think, uh, my point. Uh, to have a better planning policy, uh, we need to have a strong regulation to better manage cave and cars. We have a diverse uh, practices in uh, managing cars uh, and cave. Therefore, we need to share best practices on dealing with uh, cave and cars uh, protection as well as cave and cars <coughs> utilization. Uh, for the next uh, two years, it is just for information, the CARS Commission of the International Geographical Unions, uh, where I uh, chairing now, is preparing a monograph on land use planning on CARS landscape. I hope uh, some of you will contribute to this to share the best practices in order to promote better cave and CARS management. How to, book, uh, how to put CARS generation uh, in the regulation is also important. Uh, we have, of course, every country have their own regulation. So how to uh, advocate the land uh, zone, uh, zonation of case to be a, a strict regulation in the uh, every country it is uh, also important. Uh, we have a special planning for our case in Indonesia and we always uh, put all the cars zonation to the national planning. Uh, the geopark is now also become popular in cave and karst management platform. We have to promote more or more cave and karst uh, areas in this Google geopark networks. Uh, best practices also in karst management through geopark network is need to be documented. Uh, promoting cave and karst for world heritage inscription is also needed. Uh, for we, you know that uh, Kefir usually also uh, do uh, uh, expedition in different countries. It is I think, a good idea for uh, Kefir from different countries to uh, promote, uh, especially for protecting the cave by more, more focus on the area where there is a natural and cultural uh, heritage. Uh, with high uh, important value of cultural and uh, natural. I think this last late joint research is of, of course it is uh, important for us and hopefully uh, the 2020 years, the cave and cast years will be the good uh, momentum to promote awareness and better management. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Echo. And as a as a cultural geographer, I appreciate your mentions of landscape and culture and how um, everything fits together. That is, again, going right back to our theme. Thank you so much. Our, um, our fifth panelist, uh, Tom Gilbert. Tom, would you like to weigh in? Sure would. Thank you. <clears throat> it's a pleasure for me to be a part of this opening session. It's made me realize and think seriously about how we could be stronger together through partnerships. I, it made me realize too that I've spent now 47 years with the MAB program. Uh, that's a little bit longer than half my lifetime. So <clears throat> I want to talk very briefly about some of the things that I think could be done fairly easily to be stronger together. And um, I was fortunate to go to UNESCO back in 1973 and, and to work with quite a number of distinguished scientists. Otto Frankel, for example, Sir Otto is now known as the high prophet of the genetic resources field. Ray Dasman, 
was very helpful in launching the MAP program and he wrote the book, Can You See This? Uh, a Planet in Peril, Man and Bias Here Today. Ray said back then that it was difficult to be hopeful about man and bias here that he now controls. But he, he referred to Sir Frank Fraser Darling, his close friend and another eminent ecologist who um, I knew too. And Frank Darling addressed the 1968 Biosphere Conference. And he said, <clears throat> If our eyes are open wide enough worldwide, we can do much to avoid disaster. Well, he also warned that time was not on our side. How well have we done? I would say not too well, even though there are more than 700 biosphere reserves in the world now. And I, think something like 140 <coughs> countries. Not too well because last year the International Board Science Policy Board on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services issued the most comprehensive report ever on this subject and they say that there's an unprecedented loss during the last few de decades of species and a great decline in ecosystem services, which is one of the greatest problems that we have. So how can we be stronger together? I'll suggest two ways. There isn't a very close relationship between the network of biosphere reserves and the intergovernmental platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services. But there could be, if nations insisted that there should be, then biosphere reserves could be better learning areas for sustainability practices. The second thing that I'd like to <clears throat> call to your attention, one that would be a fairly easy partnership to develop. There is an organization called Advancement, <clears throat> the Association for Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. And they <clears throat> work in about 900 centers in 40 countries, and it's growing. Example, uh, <clears throat> we, George Wright Society and uh, Biosphere Associates, a chapter of the George Wright Society, have helped uh, establish the College of African Wildlife Management as, as one of the AISHI centers. This will be able to bring a whole new dimension to uh, sustainability, an interesting one. It's timely to develop a partnership with AISHI because they've recently called for de <coughs> developing sustainability in all of the curricula. Well, how can this be done in this difficult period? It can be done by closer partnerships with national parks, protected areas, world heritage sites, et cetera. And <clears throat> Western Kentucky University can certainly take a lead and set the example because there is a center, an AC center at, the, at Western Kentucky University and they have a silver star rating. They're working to develop a gold star rating in the AC system. And by partnering closely with, as you already have, the Mammoth Cave Area Biosphere Reserve National Park, uh, we can help develop and make the Haishi program more well-rounded in sustainability. So those, <clears throat> those are two things that I think can be done. And uh, one way that you can help is to join the George Wright Society and Biosphere Associates and help get this done. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Alexandra, uh, I think I inadvertently skipped over you in my list. Uh, I'm just, my head is just spinning with all these amazing ideas and concepts, so I apologize for that. Um, so uh, what are your thoughts on this topic? Okay, first I would like to, uh, to send my 
regards to all participants and also to express my great honor and great pleasure to be uh, involved in uh, this panel discussion. Um, I will go to, uh, directly to the, uh, to, to the answer. Conservation is similar to preservation, but while both relate to the protection of nature, they strive to accomplish this task in different ways. Conservation seeks the sustainable use of nature by humans, while preservation means protecting nature from human use or abuse. Although many nature conservation practitioners force biocentrism, the task of geoscientists is to promote equally treatment and status uh, of bio and geodiversity as it states in Austrian, Australian and Natural Heritage Center. The conservation is based on respect for both biodiversity and geodiversity. If we want to achieve adequate protection of natural phenomena, linking geology and biodiversity is needed as it uh, will enable a, great, a greater appreciation of the influence that the geological future uh, features and process may have over living plants and animals. If we could provide scientists, policymakers, stakeholders, and wider public with proper interpretation of geological and biological diversity, it is expected that, that they would become conscious of a necessity to take action and save not only the native plants and animals, but also their health. Special attention has to be paid on active involvement of academic institutions and scientists, local authorities and local communities, NGOs and media in the promotion and presentation of overall natural values. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexandra, and to all our panelists. So um, now I'm just going to uh, open up the conversation a bit. And um, if you would just, uh, if our panelists would like to jump in, you just go ahead. Um, and uh, one of the things I want to throw out is an idea that actually is, again, mentioned in your introductory statements and, and some of what of our other speakers have mentioned, um, is issue of communication and synergies between groups that maybe aren't necessarily the traditional um, karst outreach groups, people who are doing karst and involved in, in, in caves and may not really see themselves as a part of that community. So what, what suggestions, strategies do you have in mind for increasing communication and communication between this broad group of um, interested parties, whether they identify that way or not, as a way to get us uh, stronger together on these issues that are so pertinent um, to the Karsten Cave community. And I'll open it up to any of our five panelists uh, who'd like to chime in. Don't I, think, yeah, I, can, I can say a couple of things to just get us going. Um, I, I was appreciating what Bill um, Hannenberg said, our state, uh, the state geologist of Kentucky at the beginning. He made a couple of references to um, the geological heritage of Kentucky connecting um, horse racing and whiskey to the underlying landscape and, and why, you know, why it is that Kentucky is known for some of these things. And I, I think that makes a point which has also really come out during the pandemic, uh, a value of storytelling and the way we communicate um, with more of a lyrical story, you know, we, we just need to talk to each other as people and, and bring in these different angles that apply um, across, across interests. And certainly as a, as a cultural geographer, you're an expert on storytelling. Um, but this point about whiskey and horses and, you know, there's lots of, of ways to catch people's attention and pull them into a conversation, which could then turn into a conversation about conservation of karst. Um, but I think we need to talk to each other as people and recognize that we have lots of interests and lots of commonalities where we can get back to our own individual passions from those sort of common shared interests. Thank you, Sarah. Others, uh, thoughts on communication between groups and getting the message out? Maybe some strategies you've used in your own community. Thoughts? Yeah. Um, it, it's surprisingly difficult to actually implement some of these. Um, there are 
almost institutional barriers to that. And one of the things that we've, we're doing within the, the uh, Cave and Cast Working Group, we want to actually uh, revise the guidelines for Cave and Cast protection, which are now over 20 years old. And IUCN have said, oh, if it's caves and cast, it must be to do with the geo heritage. And we're doing best practice guidelines for geo heritage. So it's got to be in there. And we're trying to say, well, no, actually, what we want to look at is integrating the bio and the geo. But the structures just actually mitigate against it. So, for example, we're now working with the species survival group on cave invertebrates and protection of caves from that point of view. But it is really difficult to get that sort of integration across. And even now at this meeting, I suspect that most of us have come from a sort of geo background. And there's relatively few people who've come from a bio background and what we're trying to do is to reach out to the bio groups and sort of say okay what can we do together to promote the protection of the caves and cast so uh, that's that's my thoughts on it. it's very very difficult certainly very worthwhile um, but not easy at all because we still we don't do the whole ecosystem and I, I, I'll say one more thing, which, which probably the most enjoyable teaching that I ever did was early in my career, uh, where we, we had a, a postgraduate diploma in countryside management. And I was actually recruited as a physical geographer to teach on that. And it was taught in habitat blocks. So in fact, instead of me giving a lecture series on, as it were, physical geography, we'd have a coastal block and we would in that talk about coastal ecology and I talk about coastal processes and somebody else would talk about uh, the law as it applied to the coast and somebody else would talk about the interpretation of coastal features, archaeology on the coast and that was great. But of course the university then said yeah it was all right for a small group but we can't possibly do that with large groups of people go back to teaching in your own individual things and i don't know anywhere which actually teaches on a an ecosystem approach like that but it cast is the perfect place for it because you know those of us who are cavers most of us are cavers when you go down a cave you're looking at everything you're looking at the as it were, beasties that are down there, what evidence is there of previous humans, what can we see in the sediments, the cave itself, you're enjoying the whole environment. It's surprising how many earth scientists, for example, are more blinkered in their approach, or biologists. As cavers, we've got a real opportunity to do that. Enough. <laughs> Thank you, John. I think we all suffer from being in siloed and uh, would benefit more from those kinds of connections. I think that is an amazing um, uh, pedagogical approach and, and, and a terrific idea that maybe we could all think about that and build on that. That's, that's terrific. Any other thoughts on that topic? May I, Tom Gilbert? Absolutely. Talk about being siloed. When I went to UNESCO in 1973, I expected that there would be pretty good cooperation among the organizations that dealt with ecosystem conservation, uh, particularly IUCN, FAO, UN Environment Program and UNESCO, but this was not the case. There was more competition. And I could give you many examples of competition among the organizations. But I proposed, and we finally got established, an ecosystem conservation group where we would meet together, talk about what we could do together in planning more effectively uh, than we do through separate and, and isolated courses of action. The ecosystem conservation group <coughs> existed for a number of years. And for a while, the International 
uh, uh, what is now Biodiversity International joined. And we did some effort to try to get deliberate in situ and ex situ conservation integrated. This didn't work very well for long. There is no such thing as an ecosystem conservation group, but there certainly should be. And we could save a lot of money and do better if there were. Mm. Amen. <laughs> um, anybody else on the panel I'd like to weigh on this before we take one more topic, perhaps before we wrap up? Uh, okay, may I, Peggy? Yes, Echo, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes. For sure, it is uh, not uh, easy to bring together all the crew of uh, uh, related with, with cars. And I think it is the pandemic, uh, COVID-19, it is, it, is, it is a good uh, practices that we are doing now. How we communicate each other uh, by uh, uh, and the way like we Talk today because uh, for me uh, sometimes it is difficult to travel uh, very far away and it is uh, being the one of the handicap to get a better, better communication. So I also agree uh, we should have one uh, issue platform as a uh, uh we we have uh, we currently we have a concept of uh, human uh, uh I, I forget the, the the term but uh something to do with uh human ecological and also a natural uh a landscape uh, as a whole ecosystem human whole ecosystem so uh hawk cars can be uh uh, we we try to view cars as a whole human ecosystem, including human and also a natural and also bio. Because uh, sometimes uh, for our case, uh, how to put together between the natural and bio is also something uh, 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 sometimes difficult. But how to uh, view the cars as a, a whole uh, uh, ecosystem, uh, hum, uh, whole human ecosystem. I think uh, this is uh, my idea. Thank you. Thank you so much, Echo. Anyone else? Alexandra, uh, would you like to say anything about this topic? I'll put you on the spot. <laughs> oh, you're on, you're on, mute. there you are. Yes, I'm not familiar with cars, <laughs> and due to that, uh, I don't have any additional explanation. Okay, thank you. That's great. Okay, so uh, we just have a few more minutes, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna throw this out here to our panelists. I'm gonna give you the pen. I'm gonna give you the policy pen. Um, you can um, you have the power to come up with your a new policy uh, for the international. Uh, conservation community. What would be the uh, the one area of your 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 passion uh, for for change? What would you want to press the international community? What would you like to see in the future so we can be better and stronger together and address some of these really salient important issues that you all have brought up? Things like sustainability and tourism and 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 holistic approaches to the. The, uh, to the ecosystem. So, you know, you, you, you've got uh, 30 seconds, make your, 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 your speech before uh, a group of politicians. What changes would you like to see? I'll open that up to anyone who would like to jump in. <laughs> Any thoughts on um, making, um, Facilitating things where we get science-based decision-making, which has been appallingly absent in, in, in uh, 
uh, in the anti-science climate that we've had, at least here, I know it can speak for the United States. So how can we as scientists in the community work better to inform our politicians to make the, the decisions that are going to help in conservation in an international way? Do you see any way forward from here? I can, I can, again, jump in, Peggy, with a little bit of a, a reaction to that. And I think it's following exactly what we've been talking about and what this workshop and meetings is, is attempting to do, which is get out of these silos. And I think World Heritage, um, by definition, you know, you're looking for outstanding universal value that's limited. It's not going to be a systems approach necessarily. It's going to be this one universal value item for the, for the site. But um, for biosphere reserves and for UNESCO Global Geoparks, I, I do think that they're is a need for us as stakeholders, you know, us as managers, us as um, researchers and um, members of, of member states of these UN agencies that, that we really insist on more um, intersectional approaches, that we don't get behind a bandwagon of, you know, pro um, biosphere reserve or pro geopark, but we think about how, how are we using these international designations to push um, these systems approaches that include people, you know, that it's not just science or nature, that people are part of it. And um, I'm not going to push for one kind of designation over another. I think everyone has to decide for themselves what suits their, their situation. But I think we need to push that, that we're collaborating more. And I think the, the launch of this cave map network that's coming up, maybe I don't want to break a surprise if that's a surprise, but there's progress being made about networks of researchers on cave sites, not just the research of caves, but actually designated cave sites, conservation, and what sustainable livelihoods are associated. So I think we should really be in the driver's seat in pushing for that, you know, get out of these silos and the way we protect these sites and stop competing between the designation, what protection it is. Let's, let's just find a way to move forward. That is a wonderful summation of everything that we've been talking about. Um, any other just quick final comments uh, from any of our other yes. panels? Yes. Yeah. Go, sorry, go, go, you go first, Alexandra. Okay. Uh, I will point it out that the lack of knowledge is the biggest of obstacle to the preservation of uh, geodiversity and geoheritage. And uh, I think uh, in the near near future education should uh, be given priority over all, over all other activities uh, all the fundamental science in uh, geology is not included in the curricula of primary and secondary school uh, as a separate uh, subject this approach to education has resulted in a lack of knowledge of both the teacher and students uh, and thus uh, resulted in the end, uh, they are not familiar with the structure and composition of the earth and processing and events from geological past that made up the framework for the creation evolution of life on earth. In order to improve the overall general geologi geological education uh, of society, it is necessary to implement additional informal educational program uh, designed primarily to uh, representative of rel relevant ministry in the capacity of decision makers, particularly urban planners, and those responsible for implementation of management policies. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. Anyone else? One yeah. quickly. Yeah, yes. I, I just want to, to almost close by referring back again to this really importance, I think, of the International Year of, of Caves and Cars, because you asked, I mean, I wouldn't say legislation or anything like that, but in terms of practical actions, one of the things we can do is to try and educate the protected area managers in terms of using the IYCK as a tool to do that. And one of the things we've agreed to do, we've been working with the, the geoparks in the UK and we're going to provide them with a short information leaflet on caves and cost. And believe it or not, there are some of the geoparks that were actually unaware of the extent of the caves and cast in them. So a small but practical action. Um, we, we can't influence the, the, the international legislators. Uh, at our level, but we can do some practical actions which will build for the future. The more people that are aware of 
the Caven cast interest, the better chance we've got of getting them protected. Uh, and again, I think that's a, a, a wonderful summation of what we are talking about here today. We are sadly are running out of time, actually a few minutes over, and I apologize to the other panelists, but please feel free to add your comments to the chat or continue this conversation as we go forward uh, today. But I'm just thinking of some of the some of the words that stick in my mind that you know was a common thread. You know, education, sustainability. Uh, storytelling, you know, that is, the, I, I think that is a really powerful term that we, we just sort of pass off as, oh, well, you know, storytelling, but no, there, there, we can do better uh, to get the message out to a broad and diverse and interrelated group, people who may not even understand that they are a part of the picture. Um, so I, I think one of the greatest things about this panel is I think we are all stronger together. <laughs> this is a great strong way to spend uh, uh, our time and together move forward here. Uh, think about some of the things we talked about this morning. Please keep the conversation going. Um, even though we've run out of time, we're going to take a, a short break. And uh, I, I don't know whether Chris or Leanne are going to take over from here, uh, but we have some plenary sessions coming up. Thank you so much. Um, for allowing me to be a part of this community. Thanks to everyone involved in, in creating this uh, amazing international platform with wonderful people, with really meaningful messages and important information for all of us. Uh, thank you and best, uh, best wishes to everyone uh, around the world. Thank you so much. Thanks, Peggy. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, so as Peggy said, we're, uh, we're going to um, have a short break and probably to keep things going, let, let's um, go ahead and um, convene back at the, um, the next session. You can see on the website, the plenary session, um, and um, in 10 minutes, uh, just have a little break for our brains. So thank you very much to the, uh, to the panel and um, um, see you in a few minutes. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Yes, thanks everyone. And you can unmute yourself and, and give a little clap if you want to. I've made that um, possible for the end of the meeting. Um, so I want to say thank you as well. And um, thanks um, for all the comments. I don't know if everyone was watching the chat, but there were some great um, you know, points made and questions raised there. And so um, that'll hopefully be in our nice, neat proceedings and we can share that um, uh, again soon. So uh, see you guys at the, in the next session. Yeah, very quickly, those of us at WKU are, are uh, breathing a sigh of relief that without jinxing things, that things seem to be going smoothly so far. And I want to point out that's not automatic at all. Uh, Leanne mentioned before that she's the face of this. She's also, in fact, the brains of this. And so um, uh, to the extent things are going very nicely, let's, um, let's all have an, another clap for uh, Leanne and, and Autumn. So thank you so much.